Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Thomas Brody Sangster, Felicity Jones, Freddie Highmore, and Patrick Stewart head up an all-star voice cast as Firedrake the Silver Dragon goes in search of his dragon rider. Humans and dragons once peacefully coexisted, but when humankind started building their cities and declared war on them, dragons were forced to go into hiding, with their secret existence forgotten by humans. When human development threatens the dragon's home, a young dragon named Firedrake voiced by Thomas Brody Sangster, accompanied by Forrest Brownie Sorrel, voiced by Felicity Jones, goes out to search for the legendary Rim of Heaven as a new home for dragons to live in peace. Along the way, they encounter human orphan and thief Ben, voiced by Freddie Highmore, who Firedrake mistakenly believes is a dragon rider and agrees to help them on their quest to evade the police. But the trio are soon hunted by ferocious golden monster Nettlebrand, voiced by Patrick Stewart, who is created by an alchemist to destroy all dragons. Dragons. Dragon Rider is based off the 1997 book of the same name by German author Cornelia Funk, which was translated into English in 2004. Funk is very well regarded in children's fantasy. She's often called the German J.K. Rowling, and as such, this is not the first time that one of her books has been adapted to film. In fact, they've previously served as the source material for Inkheart and the Thief Lord. Dragon Rider was one of the films that was impacted by COVID-19 last year. It eventually got released in Germany in September. In February 2021, it was released on Sky Cinema in the UK, and it's eventually now available on DVD and Blu-ray, and in the US, it's just been picked up by Netflix, who have released it under the title of Fire Drake, the Silver Dragon, presumably to give it a little bit of distance from the various How to Train Your Dragon properties that are already on Netflix. And yes, the film definitely borrows a lot of inspiration from that movie, We'll get more into that later, but really the thing that decides this movie's fate is the fact that it has a first-time director in Toma Rashad, and the fact that it's being adapted by one of the writers of The Queen's Corgi, Johnny Smith. The results are probably what you'd expect from that combination. And indeed, the first, most immediate problem with Dragon Rider is that it suffers from a weak screenplay. This is a very loose adaptation of the book. The broad strokes of the story are here, and it hits most of the major plot beats, but there's a lot that has been jettisoned along the way. And the fact they made changes is not necessarily the problem in of itself. In fact, being overly faithful can be equally detrimental because books are aren't films and vice versa. You do have to make changes to accommodate the medium. What works in one won't work in the other. And in Dragon Rider's defense, there are some things that I will stick up for, like the fact that the dragons no longer fly by night as they do in the book. Because in the book, that makes sense on a world building level, because obviously no one can see the dragons if they're flying around at night. It camouflages them. But that's precisely the reason why it won't work on film, because otherwise you won't be able to see it. And it's a children's movie. You want to have those big, colourful flying sequences. And the film delivers that in spades. However, it's a different argument when it comes to things like supporting characters and subplots. And I feel like a lot of the world building in Funk's story has just largely been thrown out. And for a fancy tale, that's a major shortcoming because those details are what really brings it to life. They are the real magic that allows viewers to connect and engage with the world that's being told to them. And if you get rid of that, all you're left with is the bones of the story and very little of its personality. And that's precisely what happens to Dragon Rider. It feels very painfully generic right from the outset. It feels like it's derivative of numerous other fairly mediocre animated films that you've seen countless times over the years. It's the kind of movie where characters go on an adventure and there's lots of montages and there's not really all that much stakes in what's happening. And I think part of that is because of the tone. I don't think the adaptation 
captures the spirit of the book. An adaptation needs to feel like it's transferring the essence of what it's bringing to the screen, if not necessarily the letter. And the problem that I had as a viewer watching this is I often felt like it wasn't treating the source material with enough respect. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not me asking for this to be humorless. This is a fun children's adventure movie. But there is a difference between one that has those moments of comedy, but still takes its characters and its story seriously and something like this which I think is overly flippant and tries to make everything into a joke to its detriment. I think that really waters down and simplifies it for its target audience in a way that actually talks down to them and I think they will sense that as well and certainly goodbye to any adult audiences who will just sit down and watch this and immediately realise that it isn't for anyone above the age of 12. There is certainly no real storytelling nuance here and all the emotional resonance has just pretty much been removed. It feels like the story has actually been gutted in the adaptation process, which is a mighty shame. And I feel like that will really greatly disappoint fans of the book if they watch this movie. The movie sets up this environmental message that humans, in building their modern civilization, they threaten the dragon's way of life. They've pushed them to the edge of extinction and into hiding. And now, human development again is threatening the dragon's way of life. And certainly you would think that would be the backbone of the movie as well as its ticking clock, that Fire Drake has to find this new home, the Rim of Heaven, before the Dragon's Land is completely destroyed and them along with it. But the movie largely pushes this into the background, if not forgets about it, for large chunks of the movie. There is a very brief reminder in the middle, and of course it comes back at the end, but otherwise, it just goes along on its merry way and doesn't actually invest in the stake that it's set up to begin with. And you would think if they were integrating into the story, it would certainly shape a lot of the interactions that Ben as the human character would have with the others, but it genuinely doesn't. And so it feels like a major missed opportunity on that front, as well as the fact that in general, that message is very cat-handed and I don't think very applicable because unlike a lot of species threatened by deforestation, the dragons in this movie can apparently just fly somewhere else. It doesn't really work like that in real life, unfortunately. But at least that's not as bad as the section of the story in India, which in the film version just becomes a parade of cartoonishly broad stereotypes that is deeply questionable. It's the part of the movie where you definitely go, Yep, this is from one of the writers of The Queen's Corgi. And admittedly, to the UK dubbing team's credit, they have tried to mitigate this somewhat by casting husband and wife Sanjeev Bhaskar and Mira Sayao in the roles. And I think their presence alleviates some of the issues with this material, certainly a lot more than the original German version, which apparently had both male and female roles voiced by a Turkish stand-up comedian, which is, whoa, that's, that's definitely not flying here. But certainly just having them in the voice cast at least helps, but at the same time, it doesn't totally diminish the fact that the animation itself also has a lot of what I would argue to be kind of troubling depictions just in general. So it is to some extent rectified in the English dub, but not completely because the animation itself, as well as the writing of the characters, is also the problem. And then we come to the elephant in the room, namely how to train your dragon. Now, just to make clear, I don't think the book this film is based off is a How to Train Your Dragon ripoff, but the film definitely is. It's obviously made after a whole series of movies. It's derivative and trying to cash in on their success, which is not necessarily a bad thing in of itself, even as the film's poster tries to clearly evoke that movie right down to the font choice. But the thing is, there is an early sequence 
in this movie where Ben is running away from the police and he runs into a big movie premiere and the movie is How to Tame Your Dragon. Really? And this goes all the way down to the artwork in the movie which deliberately invokes How to Train Your Dragon right down to the font choice as well and as if this wasn't enough. Ben then steals a costume from the premiere to disguise himself so he's got a viking hat on and everything which just makes him look even more like Hiccup in those movies and this continues into the next sequence where he meets Fire Drake for the first time and Fire Drake sees a billboard advertising the movie and sees Ben in the costume and thinks he's the Dragon Rider. This is added for the film version as you probably worked out and so in the sequence where the dragon meets Ben for the first time he's dressed like Hiccup in those movies and obviously the filmmakers were aware that comparisons were going to be made and thought well, why don't we just beat them to it and go all meta about it? And it's just agonizingly awful because immediately it invites comparisons to that movie which are really unflattering because How to Train Your Dragon is the kind of movie I was talking about earlier where, yeah, there's moments of humor in it, but it takes its characters and its world seriously. There are genuine emotional moments in that movie for both kids and adults and Dragon Rider has none of those things so immediately you're pointing the audience towards a much better set of movies and immediately setting you against yourself 15 minutes in it is a absolutely spectacular own goal on the part of the filmmakers and certainly it damaged my perception of the film right out of the gate luckily for the film though there are some redeeming values especially when it comes to its uk dub cast who i think help elevate the movie and give it a touch of class that it desperately needs for example thomas Brody sangster is very well cast in the role of fire drake even though he appears to be the only one out of the main cast actually doing an american accent but even so he seems very well suited for this kind of kid orientated role where the character has to learn confidence over the the course of the movie and this is seen in relation to his fire breathing because dragons have forbidden from breathing fire so fire drake's a bit out of practice felicity jones sounds especially game in the role of sorrel who is very distrustful of humans and i think that she actually does really well and should do more voice acting because i think she is the best voice acted out of the main trio of characters and also i think that freddie highmore he does the best that he can with the character of Ben. It's certainly something that he's played numerous times in various other animated films over the years. And there are moments where I think that Highmore sounds a little bit stilted. Although I think that's just memories in my head of things like Justin and the Knights of Valor, which is exactly the kind of mediocre European animated film dubbed into English that I've sat through so many times like this before. And of course, the big coup for this movie is having Patrick Stewart in the role of the villain Nettlebrand. And of course, Patrick Stewart, he's an old ham. He loves to play the villain. And certainly, it's great to have him around playing the bad guy. Unfortunately, the writing of the movie lets him down because Nettlebrand is meant to be a ferocious character, but again, because the movie undermines itself and doesn't take itself seriously, whenever the character has any moment to be threatening, it's immediately diffused by comedy. Bad comedy. Because the character in this movie also has this terrible running joke that he's trying to apply for dating apps. So the movie just stops cold for these abysmal running jokes about him trying to find matches online. It is really quite awful. It's just so obviously been added for the film version. It makes no sense in this film's world whatsoever. And it's just really distracting and unfunny. I don't think kids are going to laugh at this. It feels like the kind of joke that's aimed at adults who are just going to roll their eyes like I did 
every time they brought this up, at least let the villain of your movie be scary and intimidating. Don't constantly undermine them. Even Patrick Stewart struggles with this kind of material, which lets you know just how bad it is. You've also got Nonzo Anozier playing a djinn later on in the movie, and I think he does fairly well with that, and I think that's because that character is allowed to be intimidating in the one sequence he's allowed to be in. Another strong aspect of the movie is the animation itself. The film is made by Rise Studios, which is the animation arm of an effects house that has previously worked on numerous MCU movies, as well as various other blockbusters. And the animation here is solid. It's obviously not top tier level like Pixar is, but certainly it competes with the likes of Illumination. I think that in terms of its visual quality, especially its background, it seems very colourful and very richly detailed. There's a lot of nice texturing going on here. The character designs, especially of the dragons, particularly Fire Drake, I think will be very appealing to young children. And I think that in general, the look of the movie is quite pleasing. I do think there are moments in it that have that kind of telltale CGI animation curse where occasionally characters look a little bit too rubbery or a little bit too plasticky, but generally it works overall. Certainly there are moments in this movie that look visually stunning, and I think that in terms of that level, I liked that actually the characters were quite expressive, sometimes a little bit rubbery and allowed to go off model. That certainly helped with some of the more broader slapstick elements that are forced into the script. I do think there is room for improvement here, but for a first feature from a new studio, this is impressive work that certainly competes within a very crowded animation landscape. And while the movie definitely doesn't give your mind a lot to work with, it certainly gives a lot for your eyes to look at. Dragon Rider isn't terrible, it's just very middling family fare. If you've got young kids that want to see this movie, it's mostly harmless, aside from the stereotyping that I mentioned earlier, but it is disposable and forgettable, which is a shame given the source material, and I think it will be a disappointment to fans of the book, despite the quality of the UK dub cast and the animation. I think in terms of animated movies, it's in a really crowded environment, especially given that it's on various streaming services, particularly given it's on Netflix, and it's alongside numerous other Netflix acquisitions, some of which also have the word dragon in the title, which are far superior movies. And then, of course, you have the fact that some of those streaming services also have the How to Train Your Dragon movies on them, which are also far superior, in my opinion. However, if you've got dragon mad kids, you could do far worse than this. It's just a movie that never really takes flight. If you like this review, then you can start a fire over at my Ko-fi, or you can really take flight over at my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out. Yeah.